My name is Brad Olson. I'm the head Jesus follower here, and welcome to worship at Loveland United Methodist Church. It's a good day. You might even say it's a super day. Who day? <laughs> Nothing against the LA Rams, but as for me and my house, we're going to root for the Bengals. <laughs> Many of you have been asking how I am doing. Um, if you don't know, yesterday I had the privilege of being able to lift in a powerlifting competition in Reynoldsburg just outside of Columbus, the Beyond Limits Classic. And here are some of the accomplishments that I made. Um, back in 2014, I got the opportunity to lift at the World Championships in South Africa and did a squat or tried to do a squat of 365 pounds that ripped a muscle in my leg and haven't been able to get near that weight in, what's that, eight years ago? So yesterday, for the first time since then, I tried it and got 365 pounds. So that was a huge accomplishment for me. And the other thing that you do in powerlifting meets is called the deadlift. I did a 475 pound deadlift, which again is in that category of the kind of weight that I haven't been able to do in 10 years. So this is my attempt. Who was it? Um, Dylan Thomas, the poet who said, I will not go quietly into the night. <laughs> I know that I'm getting older, but I'm going to fight this with everything that I've got and try to stay as good as I can as long as I can. It's good to be able to worship with you this morning. Um, it's good to be able to watch the game this afternoon. And also, happy Valentine's Day tomorrow. If you don't remember, tomorrow is Valentine's Day. <laughs> We've got some things going on in the life of our church that we thought you ought to be aware of and to highlight a couple of those and then to get our started with our call to worship, we're going to turn things over to Lisa. I'm repping my guy right here, the kicker. <laughs> All right, good morning, everybody. Um, as always, please don't forget to fill out your connection card. It's in your bulletin. If you have any changes to your dress or anything like that, we like to know you're here. Um, also, there's a QR code on the bottom. If you don't feel like writing this morning, you're certainly welcome to use that. One QR per family is sufficient. <clears throat> we have a lot going on. The neat thing that we have going on is the who day, you day thing that we're doing. Um, it's our Ohio River Valley, and we're in a challenge with the California Pacific West District, which is the home of the LA Rams, not to light any fires under you. So there's lots of information about that. It connects back to the Life Food Pantry, so ultimately it's more about that than the challenge. Um, we're still doing story time at LUMC. I think we finished that up today, and I was lucky to take part in that. That was a lot of fun. Then we have um, crafting with a cause. That will be on Thursday, February 17th. More info in the um, happenings on that. And something near and dear to my heart is the Fuel um, Pancake Fundraiser. We've got information in the lobby. We've got information in the happenings. Bottom line, we want you to eat pancakes. And then we still have our um, Take a Heart, Leave a Heart Valentine's exhibit out in the um, gathering area. Um, some neat things out there to check out too. All right. <clears throat> this morning's call to worship is from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 12. It is interactive. You've got the words in your bulletin, and they'll be behind me on the screen. We believe the poor in spirit are blessed. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Those who mourn are blessed. And they will be comforted. The meek are blessed. And they will inherit the earth. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are blessed. And they will be filled. The merciful are blessed. And they will see God. 
The peacemakers are blessed. And they will be called children of God. Those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake are blessed. And theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We are blessed when people revile us and persecute us and falsely utter all kinds of evil against us because of Jesus Christ. We shall rejoice and be glad, for our reward is great in heaven. And this is the word of the Lord. And if you'll all stand, we can sing together. like to invite you to join with me in the Apostles Creed you'll find the words either on the screen or printed in your bulletin I believe in God the Father Almighty creator of heaven and earth I believe in Jesus Christ his only son our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit born of the Virgin Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate was crucified died and was buried he descended to the dead on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven, is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
and so I'd like to invite you to join together with me in our congregational prayer. Let us pray. Eternal light, shine into our hearts. Eternal goodness, deliver us from evil. Eternal power, be our support. Eternal wisdom, scatter the darkness of our ignorance. Eternal pity, have mercy on us, that with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, we may seek your face and be brought by your infinite mercy to your holy presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Terry, and our first scripture reading is 1 Corinthians 15, 12 through 20. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. And those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. This is the word of the Lord. Well, good morning. Welcome to our children's moment. My name is Sharon. Um, tomorrow, of course, is Valentine's Day, which is being slightly obscured around here because of the Super Bowl, but it is Valentine's Day. And I have um, treats here in the building, so I want to give you directions to find them. And you can, you can just go whenever. Um, so you'll go down the stairs. Now there is a key. I didn't, I just didn't want to leave them out anywhere. So there's a key. It's on top of the door sill of the third door at the end of the hall. So some of you may get there at the same time. Some of you get, may get there at different times. So anyway, the, the key is above the door sill, the third door at the end of the hall. Take that key, come back up the hall. There is a door that has a window on it in a different position as the doors in the other section of the hallway. That's the door the key will work on. Once you go inside, I feel like I'm starting to lose some of you. Once you go inside, you will find a, well, there are several boxes. The one you're looking for is the orange and black box. I thought that'd be easy to remember. But there are orange boxes. There are black boxes. This is an orange and black box. That's, that's the box where the treats are. That sounds pretty complicated. You know what? Maybe I should just show you. You could just follow me. Wouldn't that be easier? Wouldn't that be easier if instead of me giving you all those directions, I said, just follow me? Who does that remind you of? Jesus said, just follow me. And this is what we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. The kids are going to be talking about walking in the footsteps of Jesus. Because even though Jesus is not here, physically with us, he left instructions, if you will. He left his word. He left the Holy Spirit. He left um, the ability for us to pray to him at all times. And one day, 1 John tells us, one day, we will see him face to face. And when we do, we'll know him because we'll be like him. And the reason we'll be like him is because in the meantime, we will have followed him by following his example. See you next time. Thank you, Miss Sharon. Thank goodness we don't have to follow a bunch of directions. We can just <laughs> follow. <laughs> oh, good morning. My name is Emily. I'm the worship leader here at LUMC. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to invite you to stand, but please worship however you're comfortable.
keep singing together. We're singing a familiar hymn this morning. I mean, we always sing familiar hymns, but <laughs> not, not during this segment usually. See 
Such a beautiful song. Our second reading is, uh, first of all, my name is Chuck. Our second reading is from uh, the book of Luke, uh, chapter 6, verses 17 through 26, Blessings and Woes. He went down with them and stood in a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all of Judea, from Jerusalem, and from the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Looking at his disciples, he said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who, are, who hunger now, for you will be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you and reject your name as evil because of the Son of Man. Rejoice in the day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated their prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you are already received your comfort. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you will go hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you will be mourned and weep. And woe to you even woe to you when everyone speaks well of you, for that is how their ancestors treated the false prophets. This is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Chuck. A great cl crowd had gathered to hear Jesus speak and to have, them, have Jesus heal them. They must have been hearing that God was doing something amazing in Jesus and wanted to be a part of what was going on. And so here is Jesus' opportunity to kind of explain what he's all about and to lay it out before all people. So what will he say? What will he do? Were you listening? He talks about blessings and woes. And in that, I hear him asking us to make a choice. Are we going to live a life seeking God's blessings, or are we going to live a life of woes? Whoa, <laughs> that's heavy stuff, isn't it? It reminded me of some of uh, Moses' last words. If you remember in the book of, book of Deuteronomy, Moses, as he's ending his days, stands right on the verge of the promised land, and he says, before you there are two paths one of life and prosperity, and one of death and adversity. Choose life, Moses says. It also occurred to me that, or uh, reminded me of a moment in Joshua's life. You remember Joshua was the one who picked up where Moses left off, took people into the promised land. But in order to get there, the people of God would have to cross the Jordan River. They all lined up on the bank of the Jordan River. God had told them that he was going to part the river the way that he had parted the Red Sea, but somebody would have to step into the water. If you'd been there, would you have taken that step? Would you have made that risk? Would you have stepped into the water? I also thought about Stephen. He was the first one who was martyred for his faith after Jesus' resurrection. You remember he was stoned to death. He had a choice too, didn't he? As people were doing him harm, he could have fought back. He could have cursed the people who were hurting him. Instead, do you know what Stephen chose to do? He said, dear Lord, please don't hold this against them. We have a choice. But we have choices that we make all the time, don't we? You got to choose whether you were going to get up this morning. You got to choose whether you were going to come here or whether you were going to sign in and watch online. This afternoon, you're going to have a choice. Are you going to watch the game or are you not going to watch the game? Who are you going to root for? As I said earlier, as for me and my house, who day? <laughs> we're rooting for the Bengals. We get to choose whether we want to live a life seeking God's blessing or a life of woes. Now, to be completely honest, honest and transparent here. I don't think that we actually get to create blessings for ourselves. I think that's God's job. God creates the blessings. God chooses who he's going to bless and when and where and how. But we get to choose whether or not we're going to be aware of those blessings, whether we're going to appreciate God's blessings, and we get to choose how we're going to respond to God's blessings. That's what we do have some choice in. All right, so what are these blessings? Jesus says it this way. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. 
Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are hated because of their faith. Woe to those who are rich. Woe to those who are full. Woe to those who are laughing. Woe to you when people say good things about you. These are hard words, aren't they? Now, they may sound somewhat familiar to you. Jesus has a way of always keeping us on our feet and always keeping the audiences that are listening to him surprised because the kingdom of God is an upside down and inside out thing. And so I imagine people at this point were wondering, all right, this is hard stuff. If the words sound familiar, it may be because you've probably heard them before. In the Sermon on the Mount, remember in, gospel, in Matthew's version of the gospel, Jesus starts out the Sermon on the Mount with the Beatitudes. Luke's version is very similar, but there are some differences. You may know this, but many biblical scholars think that the way that um, the Gospels were written was that the Gospel according to Mark was written first. And then as Matthew and Luke wrote their Gospels, they had a copy of Mark right in front of them. And then they added in some stuff from their own understanding. And so in Matthew's version, he remembers Jesus' longest section of teaching as happening on a mountain, hence we call it the Sermon on the Mount. Actually, it's more of a hill, so I'm not sure that's entirely accurate, but I'm not going to argue with that. Luke, however, remembers it a little differently. He remembers it happening on a plain or a flat area. And he remembers Jesus not only talking about blessings, but also talking about woes. Now, if it is your choice to live a life seeking God's blessings, that what might we hear in this that might guide us? Are there some guiding principles to help us see God's blessings and recognize them when they do happen? And here's one that I'd like to suggest, and it is that to find God's blessing, you have to look beyond your circumstance. You have to look beyond your circumstance. If I were going to write the Beatitudes, I might include something like, if it's a blue sky and a warm day, I am blessed. If I've got food on the table and I've got a roof over my head, I'm blessed. If I have all the right answers and never have to admit that I'm wrong, I am blessed. If I can be so easygoing that I don't have to worry about my sins, I am blessed. But what does Jesus say about blessings? He says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the hungry. Blessed are those who weep. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of their faith. Now, I don't think that Jesus is saying here that we ought to try to be poor or hungry or sad all the time or hated. But what I think Jesus is saying is that when we are, when we are going through those difficult times, we need to be aware of how God's grace is working because often it's during those times that we are more open and receptive. I think God is blessing us all the time, but I think it's during those times that we are more open and receptive to see God's grace at work in our life and to be changed by it. And so I think during those times, we're more likely to see God's miraculous power in our life. For example, I read about this family who was having a really dif difficult time. They were um, on the verge of losing everything. And then, to make matters even worse, a robber broke in and invaded their house. When the police showed up, they asked the family, so what did the robber get? And their answer? Practice. <laughs> I like that, don't you? They hadn't lost their sense of humor in the midst of difficult times. They were looking for some good news in the midst of difficulty. I also, there's a pastor by the name of Leif Anderson who, in his sermon on this passage, remembered a time when his dad took him to see a World Series game. I know it's baseball instead of football, but it's the closest I could come. He was an avid fan of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Remember when the Dodgers were in Brooklyn? And he got to go and see them play the Yankees in a World Series game. He was so excited, he said. The problem was that Dodgers had a lousy game. 
no hits, no runs, didn't even get anybody on base. He thought it was the end of the world. Years later, he said, he ran into a person who was a walking encyclopedia of sports knowledge. You know somebody like that? Maybe you are somebody like that. And he was talking a little bit about his experience with the World Series and having been there at the game, and he was saying it was just so disheartening. And this friend of his says, you were at that game? That was the first perfect game pitched in a World Series. It was the first no-hitter, the first perfect game that was pitched in a World Series. He said, and you got to be there to experience that. How often is that like God's blessings? That what we think is a disaster is, in fact, God trying to get some message of his blessing and his grace through to us. I had a, something of a reminder of that a week and a half ago when it started snowing. I know that what we're supposed to do when it snows and ices is we're supposed to stay in where it's safe. But I grew up in upstate New York, and my memory of growing up when it snowed was what my parents would do is they would give me the car keys and tell me to go out and drive in the stuff. Their thinking was that if you could get experience driving in bad conditions when you didn't have to get someplace, then if you ever were in a position where you did have to get someplace, you'd at least have some comfort and have some comfort in um, in driving in those conditions. So when it started snowing, I got the keys and went out for a drive. And here's what I was reminded. It's really tempting when the weather's that bad to focus on what's just 10 feet in front of you. The problem with that is you got to see what's beyond that, right? Because in bad weather especially, when something's going to go wrong, you have to kind of anticipate it. You've got to know where the road turns. And if a car's stopping in front of you, you've got to I think in motorcycle driving, they call this looking beyond the curve. You've got to anticipate what's coming up. I think that's a big part of what Jesus is trying to do here. He's saying if you want to recognize, appreciate, and respond to God's blessings, you've got to look beyond what's happening in the moment. So what's that mean for us? Well, if you're going through some rough times, if th things seem really difficult now, if you're having a hard time seeing what the future holds or getting very excited about what's going on in the next day, you may be in the perfect position to find God working in some miraculous way, some sign of his grace. This may be the time when you can experience, like no other time, God's blessing. But then on the other side of it, he also says, be careful when things are going well. He says, woe to you who are rich. Woe to you who are full. Woe to you who are laughing. And woe to you when people are speaking well of you. Those are hard things to hear, aren't they? Difficult things to hear. Because most of us are, I mean, let's admit it, we're, we're doing okay for ourselves. I think what Jesus is saying is when things are going well, be careful of not getting too, taking too much credit for it or of getting to feel like um, you get all the credit and that you don't need God. Those are times where it's best to remember the way that God works his grace and to have a little bit of humility in, in the midst of it all. Be careful when things are going well. This is probably too early to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. I, I saw an article in the Houston Chronicle about um, what happens to football players after they leave the NFL. All right, it, no, I, I'll do it anyway. Do you know what happens to football players after they leave the NFL? Um, one in four reports um, experiencing financial difficulties in the first year after they retire. Of the marriages that fail, 50% of them fail in the first year after players leave the NFL. The suicide rate, and this is both among active and retired players, is six times the average. Over half of them leave with permanent injuries, and 78% of NFL players are either unemployed, bankrupt, or divorced within the first two years after leaving the game. There's an author by the name of John Piper in a book called Hunger for God who says this, and I think it's interesting. The greatest enemy of hunger for God is not the poison, but apple pie. 
It's not the banquet of the wicked that dulls our appetite for heaven, but the endless nibbling at the table of the world. It's not the X-rated video, but the primetime dribble of triviality that we drink from every night. The most deadly appetites are not for the poison of evil, but for the simple pleasures of this earth. For when we, ro- when we replace these for an appetite for God himself, the idolatry is scarcely recognizable and almost incurable. The prophet Jeremiah says it like this. There are two kinds of people, the cursed and the blessed. This is how he describes the cursed. He says, thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like the shrub in the desert and shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhabited salt land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like the trees planted by the water, sending out roots by the stream. They shall not fear when heat heat comes and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought, it is not anxious. It does not cease to bear fruit. My attempt to do this yesterday as I, I was competing, my prayer yesterday at the beginning of the day and basically every time I've been competing here recently has been, Lord, help me in my moments of victory to stay humble and help me in my moments of defeat to stay courageous. So what's the message for us? Well, I think it's this. If things are going for pretty well for yourself, remember. Remember those who are having a difficult time. I think that's why our district superintendent is encouraging us also to give something to the poor during this um, Super Bowl season, to remember those who are struggling and those who are having difficulty. And remember that all of our blessings are a gift from God. I started out um, talking about Moses and his talking about two different paths, the path of life and the path of death. I think that's a challenge for us also to decide which way we are going to choose and to choose well. I love the story, and this goes back to the ancient rabbis, a story the ancient rabbis used to tell about um, one day when the prophet Elijah showed up and visited a farmer. Now, in the Old Testament, the prophet Elijah is kind of like the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. He can kind of show up wherever he wants and comes and goes and always has some profound lesson to teach. In this particular story, the prophet Elijah was um, traveling around with a young rabbi who was trying to learn Elijah's ways and understand a little bit about the nature of God. And so he was with him learning um, as they visited this farm. And this farmer, when he greeted them was just mean and miserable. What he said is that he had a well that he needed to dig, and so he didn't have any time for Elijah and his friend. So he made them stay out with the animals. He, instead of giving them a nice meal, he gave them some water and some bread because he had this well to dig, and he didn't want to take time um, distracting him from taking care of, by taking care of these visitors. Well, in the night, as the story goes, Elijah dug the well for this farmer. And in the morning, the young rabbi couldn't understand why Elijah, when this man had treated them so hatefully, had done something nice for him. And Elijah said, it's true that that well will produce nice, sweet water for hundreds of years. But what you don't know is that where he was planning on digging, there was a treasure that will now go undiscovered for a hundred years. I think this is what Jesus is encouraging us to do, is to not let the treasure of God's blessings go undiscovered for the next hundred years, but to have hearts and minds that are open to seeing the blessings that are offered to even the poor, the hungry, to those who are weeping, and to those who are persecuted for their faith. One opportunity that we have, where is Ken? Is he ready? He'll be right back. So I need to spill a little bit of time here. (laughs) One of the opportunities that we have to experience those blessings is something called the walk to Emmaus. These happen, Ken, are you ready? These happen a couple of times a year, and we've got one that's coming up in March. I happen to be on the team. Ken is also on the team, so we thought we'd make you a little bit aware, more aware of this opportunity because you're probably saying to yourself, what is the walk to Emmaus? And so we brought in an expert to share with you. Ken, it's all yours. 
Uh, thank you. If you will, travel back with me to the summer of 1996. Ah. My daughter Rebecca was uh, high school to junior B, and she was invited by Matt Kroger, who now happens to be a Methodist pastor, of all things, to attend a program called Chrysalis. Now, I vaguely remember from high school science that Chrysalis had something to do with the transformation of a lowly caterpillar into a beautiful butterfly. Little did I know that this chrysalis would not only transform Rebecca, but our entire family. Now, time won't let me go into how wonderful the chrysalis program is, but feel free to ask me or youth leaders, Pax and Jennifer Dellinger, about it if you have a high school student who wants to know more. But what I will tell you now is that as a result of her going on this chrysalis, she was able to sponsor her mother and me on our walk to Emmaus. Walk to Emmaus is a non-denomination, non-denominational international program. In fact, I've got a friend that went to his walk in China. It's governed by the Upper Room Ministries in Nashville, Tennessee. It's a 72-hour program that begins on a Thursday evening and runs through Sunday. The local walk here is held at St. Paul Community United Methodist Church in Madeira. The name was taken from the story in Luke 24 about two men on the road to Emmaus after the crucifixion who are joined by a stranger. And they didn't recognize him as Jesus until they sat down with him to eat. And it was at that time that their eyes were opened. And for me, as a seemingly lifelong Christian, it was on my walk to Emmaus that my eyes were also open. My walk was the biggest spiritual adventure of my life. No guarantee, but most people I know find a similar experience. There are a number of people at Love One United Methodist that have already gone on a walk. And if you're here, you know, I know Sharon. And you raise your hand. And just, so there's a few of us here. So you can ask them about it and what their, their experiences were. Uh, so here are a few of the logistical um, points I'd like to share. Walks are separated by gender. The men's walk, the next one, is March 10th to the, the uh, 13th. As Brad alluded, uh, he is going to be on that walk, and so am I looking forward to it. And the one question I always ask when I serve on a team is, why? Am I on this team? And what is God's plan for me on this team? And usually there's some pretty amazing thing that happens. You will stay there the entire time, and that means you'll sleep on a cot, uh, but you'll be very well fed, and you will bond with people like you've never bonded in your life, guaranteed. And there's showers, so you can even get cleaned up if you so choose. Um, there are people that wear their fuzzy little slippers and just kick back and relax and, and uh, leave their cell phones and their, their watches behind. You'll need a sponsor. If you don't know somebody that's been on a walk, then talk to me or Sharon or Brad or, and we'll find a sponsor for you. There's a $125 fee, but if that doesn't fit your budget, we'll find the money. And lastly, if you say this all sounds great, but no way can I sleep on a cot for three nights, there's also a program called Face-to-Face -face Encounter. Uh, it meets on four non-consecutive days in May. So if you'd like to know more, if you're interested, stop by and talk to me out in the narthex. I actually have applications, and we can go from there. Uh, men, you need to act quickly, because four weeks from now, we're going to be on our walk with hopefully some of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I would like to encourage you to look further into the Walk to Emmaus. It's not intended to be um, an experience to fix people that are broken. It's, tended to be an ex it's intended to be an experience to inspire people who are faithful. Will you join with me in prayer? Let us pray. Well, holy and gracious God, we do pray for this upcoming men's Walk to Emmaus. 
We pray for the plans that are being made now, for the talks that are being written, for the people that are considering being a part of this. We pray that you'll move in their hearts to let them know whether this is an opportunity to, um, that they would like to be a part of. We pray that you will give your blessing to this experience. We pray also for the game this afternoon. We pray that it will be a reminder in the words of 1 Timothy 4, 8, that physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better, promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. We pray for the Winter Olympics, for the wonder of what the human body and the human spirit can accomplish. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but may we hope with as much passion to receive an imperishable one. We pray for the tensions that are going on in the Ukraine. We know that you are a God of peace, and so we pray that by some miracle of your grace, peace will prevail. And we pray for the tensions also in Taiwan. We know that the world is a difficult place right now. But we also know that you are a God of love, and so we're grateful for the love that you have shown us in Christ, often through other people, for patience with our failings, for kindness in our weak moments, for praise when we have done our best, forgiveness with, um, without counting the times, for those who go with us when the going gets rough, for those who trust us again after we've abused their trust. For all the gifts of your love, we thank you, and especially that your love for us is stronger than death. For we offer our prayers this morning in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who taught the disciples once and teaches us still to pray together by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Will you stand and join together in singing our closing hymn? Oh, how... support our mission to connect faith with love financially there's an offering box just to the left of the door as you leave your giving is very much appreciated there's also a button on our website lovelandumc.org where you can give electronically in 1979 they were doing some excavations outside of the city of Jerusalem and they found a um, it was kind of a wad of silver and after cleaning it up a little bit they realized that it was a rolled amulet of silver 
they decided, let's see what happens if we unroll this amulet. And inside of it, they found, written in Hebrew, what they now think are some of the oldest words ever written. They can also be found in the book of Numbers. Are you interested in what these words are? They say this. May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May God turn his face towards you and give you peace. Stay safe and be well. Happy Valentine's Day. Go in peace to serve the Lord. And the people of God all said...